All right. I think I think we're live now. Live. All right. Well, excellent. Good afternoon, outdoor outreach community. Uh, my name is Lesford Duncan. I'm the senior director of programs here at Outdoor Outreach. And today we have the distinct pleasure of bringing on esteemed guest, Sophia Dannenberg, the first black woman and the first African-American to summit Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world standing at just over 29,000 feet. At Outdoor Outreach, we introduce youth to the transformative power of the outdoors with the hope of inspiring them towards similar heights and similar possibilities. Sophia, I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and I'll pass it over to Vinny and Tati to take it from here. Thanks, Les. Hello, everyone, once again. My name is Vincent with Outdoor Outreach. I'm a field instructor, former Outdoor Outreach participant and leadership program graduate. And for those of you that are new here, Outdoor Outreach is a San Diego-based youth development nonprofit that it connects youth to the outdoors as a space for them to build resilience and confidence in their power to make a difference. Today, I'm joined by Tatiana Butte and special guest, Sophia Dannenberg. As Les said, the first black woman and first African-American to summit Mount Everest. She currently leads the International Policy Analysis Program in Environment, Health, and Safety at Boeing in Seattle, Washington. Sophia grew up in an indoorsy family. She was introduced to hiking and camping in college, finding a love for the outdoors as she learned to rock climb and mountain here. She has climbed all over the world and in 2006 became the first African-American and Black woman to summit Mount Everest. She loves sharing her passion for athletics and the outdoors and has volunteered with the Special Olympics, Passages Northwest, and the Sierra Club inner, inner city outings. Sophia was also recently appointed to Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission by Governor Jay Inslee. We'll do a few introductions before we jump into our Q&A with Sophia. I'll pass it to you, Tati. Thanks, Vidi. I am Tatiana Butte, and I am a former leadership participant, and I am a 2019 leadership um, graduate, and I'm currently a college student studying uh, communications and criminal justice, and I'll pass it on to you, Vinny. Thanks, Tati. Sophia, is there anything you'd like to add to your bio before we hop into some questions? No, that was great. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Sophia. Sophia, it's great to have you. And I'm going to pass it off to you, Sati, to kick off our Q&A. And for the viewers at home, feel free to chime in and join our conversation with comments or questions in the chat box. Back to you, Tati. Thank you. So good afternoon, Sophia. It's such an honor to meet with you. And I would like to know, how are you doing on this Monday, considering what is going on with our current world? I'm doing okay. Um, the sun is out and really trying to focus on all of the sort of beautiful, happy things that um, I can. But yeah, it's a lot going on. Thanks for asking. No problem. We should be able to voice what's going on and not feel ashamed to speak about it. And so with that, let's go on to our first question. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the outdoors, specifically mountaineering? So um, the short answer about mountaineering is really that I had a friend from high school who wanted to climb Mount Rainier and she needed somebody to climb with and she had never done any mountaineering and so she was planning on learning and so she asked me if I wanted to go with her and if I wanted to take like, there weren't like formal lessons, it was just a friend of hers, um, she lived in New Hampshire and a friend who was a climbing guy who was going to teach her. So she asked me if I wanted to go and I was like, yeah, sure, that, that sounds amazing. Um, but at the time, I actually didn't know what Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier was, which is funny because I can actually see Mount Rainier out my window like right now. But um, at that point, I hadn't heard of it. Um, mm -hmm. And for all the young people, I am old. So this is like a little bit like pre like internet. So I couldn't have just Googled it at the time in my own defense. I would have had to like pull out like an Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, y'all don't know what that is. But like, yeah, I would have had to pull up something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I'm like, girl, you look good. So, hmm. <laughs> um, okay, what what, what um, got you inspired to do mountaineering in the first place? So, I mean, so I, like a lot of it is just creep. Um, that same friend from high school, um, when I was go I was moving to Japan after college, and she wanted to do a bonding trip. 
And so we actually planned a rock climbing trip together because she was scared of heights. And so it was supposed to be our thing, like, you know, we're going to go rock climbing and get over her fear of heights. I actually didn't go. I was um, writing a travel guide that summer and I got extended from, um, from the Thailand to Laos. And it was like, I never actually came back to the United States in time for that trip. And so she went rock climbing on her own, fell in love with it and um then had been doing it for all of these years and um then like years later i was visiting her and i still hadn't gone rock climbing so she was like really like insistent that i learn this and again you know allison asked me to do stuff and i'm like yeah i'll try it so um she convinced me to go rock climbing um because kind of out of guilt also um and then from there i started ice climbing and like each of these little things, like nothing, like if you rock climb and ice climb and you also hike, I've been doing a lot of hiking at that point. Mountaineering is just one more little step. So mountaineering didn't seem like a really big deal when I had done it. Um, that Rainier trip was just like signing up for it. But at that point I had already rock climbed and ice climbed. So climbing a big icy mountain just felt like I was putting previous skills together. Wow, that's really impressive. I I love rock climbing. I'm just like, whoa, mountaineering, ice, what? <laughs> um, in in during your during your bio, you mentioned um, it was mentioned that you came from an outdoorsy indoorsy family, and so I would like to know what was your favorite childhood memory of the outdoors and why. So you know, my family didn't like camp or hike or anything like that. But I was outside a lot. Um, both of my parents come from um, very, so very um, poor um, outdoor agricultural backgrounds. So my mother's family were sugarcane farmers, um, and they were actually um, they farmed on other people's land. And my father um, was in South Carolina, and my father actually, when he was young, picked picked, uh, picked cotton uh, just to have a little bit of money. So both my family like. I, I think like they just didn't think of the outdoors as being like somewhere where you necessarily recreate, right? It was a place where you work. So it was being outside, but I love to be outside. Like um, I took horseback riding lessons when we lived in Kentucky. Uh, I used to love to like bike around um, my neighborhood, like just, you know, the kids like, you know, like you see in Goonies and those movies, again, it makes me so old, but like those movies where like the kids are biking around the neighborhood, we used to do that. Um, and even when I was little, when I lived in Japan, um, I can remember like running around the sugar, sugar cane fields with my cousins um, while my our family worked. So just like running around like the farm between the sugar cane and like making up games or like making up games in like the little tiny forested area behind our townhouses. So there was just a lot of like creative play just with like outside and with whatever we had available to us. So it wasn't really about like going to a national park or going to what you would consider to be a traditional space, but like just finding fun things to do outside right where I was. I can understand that from childhood it to me it's like it it um, installs you for your for your life it's just that one part of your childhood can just express yourself throughout your growing up process and such i mean and i was always you that such a there. big factor within our our life process yeah yeah so uh, uh, <laughs> imagination runs wild yeah. Um, next question, as both a woman, as both a woman, as both a woman and a person of color, could you tell us about any barriers that you experienced in a mountaineering career and how you overcame them? So I think there's um, like when I was a beginner, I think I maybe didn't notice as much when I was younger, when I was like a beginning climber. Um, I think like there were things happening that I would say I probably didn't know was happening. And I only realized as I became more experienced um, that I think the biggest thing was this constant assumption that I wasn't a climber. This, like, I would meet people and um, I was always being assumed to be 
a beginner. And this didn't just come from men, this came from women. Um, one of the most discouraging things I can remember in like, you know, it sticks in my mind as a story is there were these, this woman who had led a climb of a mountain called Alma de Blom that I wanted to climb. And I actually did climb. I'll say I climbed it actually this, the same year that I met her. Um, and uh, I was really excited to meet her. Like she, was a, she had led this climb. And so I wanted to talk to her about it. And I said, oh, you know, you climbed Amna Plum. You know, I'd love to talk to you. I really want to do it. And she, the tone in her voice totally changed. And she just said like, well, I mean, have you climbed anything before? Do you climb? Like, what do you do? And it was, and at this point I had actually climbed like several mountains that were, you know, 20,000 feet and higher. I had been an independent mountaineer. I had led my own climbs. I was really experienced and it really took me aback. Um, and honestly, it probably wasn't until, and if you can believe this, like that same year I met Lynn Hill, who's like a really famous rock climber and I had a book signing. And at some point, like she just was like, you know, so are you, so are you a climber? Like, what do you do? And like her tone didn't assume at all that I wasn't, it was just person at a book signing. And I was like, yeah, you know, I want to do some mountaineering. And she was really encouraging. She was like, oh yeah. Like, you know, I was like, I want to do more. And she's like, you should do that. You should follow your heart. And it was, I think like this balance of those two experiences that really like, you know, showed me, as I said, like, like it was, one was encouraging and discouraging, but like, I don't think that first woman really even knew what she was doing like she didn't even think of the fact that she was just making this assumption and then since I've become more and more experienced I've seen it more um like I you know I came to I moved to Seattle after I climbed Everest and um I went to the mountaineering groups here and same thing like I constantly was being sent to the like learn to mountaineer or like hey why don't you go take our learn to climb class and <laughs> you know, these learn to climb classes were being taught by people who were less experienced climbing than I was. Um, and it was, it was really discouraging. Um, what I will say that's funny though, is that a lot of my mountaineering was done internationally. And I felt like um, when I was outside the United States, especially like the issues of race were less significant. Like definitely mm -hmm. it was unusual that I was a woman and everyone noticed that I was a woman. Um, but they tended to be kind of po mostly positive about it, even if it was kind of irritating. Like the guys kind of thought it was like cute or funny and they were, you know, encouraging me. But like, um, I feel, feel like, you know, nobody really thought anything of my race because in fact, if a lot of the places where I climbed, um, they're, the people there are brown. So uh, South America and um, Nepal, Africa. And so the locals especially loved it. Like they were so excited to see me there and they were really encouraging and really happy and they all wanted to talk to me, you know, and they were so excited to be somebody, like, I don't think of myself as looking like Nepali, but to Nepali people, to the Sherpas, I look a lot more like them than most of the climbers they see. And so they were really excited to see me there and they were so like, um, yeah, they were so encouraging. And so in that sense, like, I think, um, yeah, it was a very sort of American experience to, uh, to be dealing with issues of race. Um, and, but like the issue of being a woman, I think I see that everywhere. <laughs> it's sort of a long answer, so, yeah. No, thank you for sharing. I, this is very, I love to hear about this, especially coming from a woman of color who has done so much in her, in her career and prevailing for her, um, and prevailing for, um, I'm sorry, um, for the outdoors. And so I very much look up to you as, as a role model and thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. All right, yeah, that was a beautiful response. Um, I loved how you just touched on both sides of the spectrum. Um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and go into my question. So first off, I would like to say, uh, you know, just how Tati said, how inspiring you are to so many people. Um, I know my younger sister is tuning in today and is so excited for this inter interview with you. And so as a young man, as a young multiracial young man, a young African-American man in America, I have often experienced challenges when accessing certain areas or participating in certain activities. Is there anything you would say to those folks um, who may have the ability to invite, encourage, and promote the sharing of these spaces, activities, and lifestyles that are often out of reach and hidden from so many people of color? Um, I think there's probably two things. I, I mean, I think that there is one of just um, 
outreach, right? Inviting people, like literally inviting people to come in. But I think especially now, as more and more people of color are just, uh, young people of color are just involved in the outdoors. Like I just have to like say like, as for me, like the heat, there's such a huge difference right now. Like I used to be able to go to the rock climbing gym and just say, yeah, I'm the black girl. Like, and like now I'm like, oh, I have to like say I'm the black girl with the long hair and the curly, like there's other black girls there, right? So like there are more people of color and I think more different types of people who are coming to these sports, to like outdoor recreation. Um, and there's like, they've always been there, by the way. I'll say like black people have been in the outdoors like this whole time, but like maybe not in the same kind of formal recreation space, like the skiing and the rock climbing and things like that. Um, and I think there's one thing of just being welcoming in the most basic way. And I feel like, you know, this is a very kindergarten sort of lesson, but there is something that just says like, be nice and don't be elitist to anybody. <laughs> Cause, uh, uh, well, I mean, I think this starts thing. one thing is that like unconscious bias is unconscious, right? So you don't actually know if maybe like, you know, there is a bias in there. And there's all kinds of studies that show that people are more drawn to people that are like them, that look like them. And so, um, especially if you're in that space and there aren't, you know, you see someone who doesn't look like you, you know, you could just inadvertently like be, you know, behaving in a certain way that you don't know about. And so, especially when I go to like rock climbing gyms, I have to tell people like, this is a sport that is, and same thing with like surfing and a bunch of these, like there's these sports that I, they have this a little bit of elitism to them, right? There's this kind of territorialism and there's this little bit of elitism. And I also, especially will talk to people um, who are, um, I would say, uh, let's say typical looking people on the sport. They tend to be sort of handsome, young, athletic looking, um, generally white men. And they're like, you know, I'm not biased. I treat everybody the same, you know, I'm just, you know, whatever, like, um, or I'll talk to like, and from when I was young, it was like old dudes who would be like, you know, I'm not mean to, you know, just women. I mean, I mean to everybody. Um, and the thing is like, you know, that even if you are like, even let's say that that's true. Like you're actually equally elitist to everybody or that old dude is equally mean to everybody. It's going to disproportionately impact people who otherwise don't think they belong, who otherwise don't feel comfortable because you know, they don't see anybody like them in that space. So whereas you could be thinking, like you could be have the same sort of attitude towards two people, but someone who looks around and sees a bunch, like they're, they're that sort of young, white, athletic, handsome man has spent his life feeling like he belongs in every space. And so you being not nice to him, you being elitist towards him, um, he's not going to be turned away in a way that somebody who is maybe, um, you know, doesn't, who come, who's a person of color, who doesn't see people like them, somebody who has a different body type, somebody with different abilities, they're more likely to be turned away. And I think a lot of um, the, you know, I think a lot of the things that we see perpetuated are, are done by people who are, you know, doing it unintentionally and not realizing, you know, when I talked about that woman who made that comment to me, I mean, like maybe she's equally rude to everybody, um, right, the woman who was like, you know, have, have you climbed anything when I said I wanted to climb Amada Blanc, but the difference is, like, for me, I didn't know, like, I was like, is it, you know, in the little bit of my back of my head, I, I had to wonder, like, is she, is she behaving that way just because she's mean, and she's just a mean person, or is it because I don't look like a climber, because I'm short, because I'm brown, because I'm dark, because I'm small, because, you know, what, what, I, I didn't know. And instead of, you know, whereas again, like if you had been like, again, if I were like some tall, handsome, strong, athletic white man, he would have just been like, yeah, she's just rude. <laughs> right. So like, there's like, I think there's something that just says, like, if you're in that space, like you have to be welcoming and nice across the board to everybody. <laughs> like, and as I said, it feels so kindergarten, but I think it's really important. Thank you so much for touching on that. Um, you know, at Outdoor Reach, we're all about inclusivity and you know making those opportunities you know open for all so thank you for touching on that Les I'll pass to you. Totally Sophia I, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on that um and that that was really powerful I mean in, in terms of welcoming sometimes people just need to be nice and so many of our so many of our program participants have have just run up against people that that are territorial about those spaces um, this follow-up question is, is specifically speaking to land managers, and as, as you said on the, the Parks and Rec Commission, um, 
for, uh, for the state of Washington, um, many of the, the folks in our community also represent public land management um, agencies, both on the, on the state, local level, um, that have leaned in, that have partnered with us, and that are, are constantly asking the question, how can we do better systematically? Um, and so from, from your purview as a, as a parks commissioner um, and, and working with uh, land management agencies, what, what are some, some tangible uh, pieces of advice that you would share with land managers as well? I mean, I think that there's a lot about, and I think that, that especially like parks commissions are seeing a lot now around communication, um, making sure that you're communicating opportunities um, in different types of spaces and in different sort of modes. I think that social media has helped a lot just to kind of get the word out that you exist and how you might be able to access these spaces. Um, I think that there's a lot when they offer programming about being able to um, offer culturally relevant programming to making sure that um, there are offers, you know, in, in different languages, if that's relevant in, in the area that you're in. Um, I think there's a lot about also looking at the actual systems and processes. So, for example, there are, um, you know, there, there, there are camping recreational places where the only way you can get a reservation to access it is to show up at like, you know, three o'clock on Thursday. And showing up at three o'clock on Thursday means that if you want something for Friday or Saturday, um, you have to have time off work. You might have to have you know extra resources to stay um, in a town. And very sometimes you know people aren't comfortable in the town. Sometimes there are some small towns that are maybe not welcoming to uh, people who are different. And so um, I think there's a lot about saying, okay, what systems do we have in place um, in terms of processes, and is the system in itself inadvertently causing um, um, a you know some kind of bias or disproportionate impact. And I focus on these systems, by the way, because I feel like it's low hanging fruit. There are issues of sort of overt racism, overt, you know, um, problems, but like those are harder to solve. Like it's harder for me to say, I'm gonna take somebody who's racist and make them not racist, but it's much easier for me to say, I'm going to, you know, change a system that's not meant to be um, biased, but is. And so for me, it's like, there's a lot of low hanging fruit still that we can, we can, um, attack. Thank you for that. Um, and Sophia, my last question is, you are a leader on many fronts, both in the mountaineering and in the corporate world at Boeing. Could you share with, the, with our audience, how do you define good leadership? So I think, um, especially like, uh, I think I see this most when I'm in policy and politics, but for me, there's a lot about saying that you are um, listening, you're learning, um, also that you're teaching, um, and there is that you're teaching, you know, if, if there are systems in place, um, you know, I take a lot of, you know, of teaching people how to access those systems. Um, and then truly when I do have a seat at the table, making sure that I'm really representing um, the people that I'm leading, making sure that I'm bringing in their voices um, uh, very directly. Um, I like to just, just small things like saying somebody's name, like say, you know, acknowledging the people who worked on things, um, not just being like, oh, like my team did this, but being like, oh yeah, like John and Brian and Jay all worked on this, like making sure that other leaders know who they are and that they're very visible. Um, because I think there's just so much that leaders end up really focusing on being in charge. And for them, it's about some kind of executive function as their primary role um, and having to make executive decisions. And I think that is true, like you have to do that. But um, most of it is, I think, about bringing, like, as I said, making sure that other people's voices can be, can be heard and are represented. And this is, and, you know, especially for me in politics, like this is especially tough if like it's not necessarily something I, I agree with. Um, not necessarily like something fundamental, but just, I don't know, just like, you know, someone thinks that, you know, there should be five minutes per person to speak and I think there should be two. Um, just saying, well, the majority of people think that there should be five minutes of person. <laughs> going ahead and saying, I'm really representing what, what the people think um, and making sure I have like my ear to the ground and the trust of people that I'm, I'm leading so that they're willing to talk to me and they know that I'm, I'm willing to hear um, and, and to represent them. 
thank you so much for your for your response. Thank you. All right. So um, finally, I'd like to ask you if you have any other final thoughts or comments you'd like to leave us with before we take additional questions from the audience. Um, well, I mean, just thank you so much for having me here. And I am so excited to hear about organizations like yours. As somebody who um, grew up at a time when there were not organizations like these and who had to kind of find my way on my own, I think it's so important to change to like implementing systematic change that there are organizations that are out there um, trying to really uh, make the outdoors accessible to so many other young people. And so I, this is a really great thing that you're doing. And um, I'm so happy to, that you've invited me into this space. Thank you so much, Sophia. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so now we have time to take questions from the audience. If there's any, please comment with anything you'd like to ask Sophia. I'll be checking out the chat box here. Cue the Jeopardy music. <laughs> a lot of uh, love on our, our Facebook platform here, Sophia, for you. Everybody's hooting and hollering. Les, you got a shout out. Tati, you got a shout out. <laughs> and I'm having some trouble loading the newer comments. So we'll just kind of skip ahead. And, um, once again, Sophia, thank you so much for joining us here today. Tatiana and Lesford, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's a pleasure to see you guys here, um, even, in, even in this virtual space. Um, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. And I'd like to pass to Les so you can give a shout out for a Thursday announcement. Absolutely awesome. I, I do want to I do want to call out this one question that I saw came in from from Hana, um, and it's uh, it's for Sophia. Do you have any stories of impact that have stood out um, to you in working with organizations like She Jumps or Nature Bridge, um, who we who we know you know partners are doing phenomenal work um, as well in creating that access. Um, stories that have stood out to me. Um, I have to think about it, but I think there's a, as I said, I think that there's a lot, and for me, it goes both ways of, you know, seeing, especially new people really, you know, seeing things sort of catch on and stick um, with Nature Bridge, like in the environment. Um, I would see, you know, I, 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 before I joined the board of Nature Bridge, I actually visited um, their program and um, I went through and I asked like all the kids, like, how did you end up here? Like, why are you here? And a, and a couple of them were basically like, well, I don't know, it was something I do. I was just kind of dragged here by the teacher. And um, just to see though, that them sort of like really start to get it as the, the week went on, you know, kids who started with sort of like, you know, they, they weren't opposed to it, but like they didn't have any particular, like, you know, huge desire. Like these are not kids who would have sought this out, you know, had somebody not, you know, the te that teacher had not really like kind of dragged them along and really seeing how important it became to them and how much they learned and how much they learned to love it. It really, you know, it, it really, it's really encouraging. I think it's encouraging for leaders in these organizations um, that you can really make that type of difference. Excellent, thank you so much, Sophia. And again, um, you know, I just wanna echo the thank yous uh, all around, so many, so many people in our community um, have have really been looking forward to this live stream chat. Um, and to me personally, it, it, I mean, you really represent um, representation in this sport. Um, as I shared with you before this call, you've um, helped to inspire me, um, and really inspired me to take my first Everest base camp trek, not to the summit, <laughs> just just to the base camp. Um, and so just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the work that you do in increasing representation um, and allowing young people to see possibility and to see higher heights. So just wanted to say thank you again for that. Thank you. As, as a quick announcement, so as we're, as we're wrapping up this live stream, um, we, we definitely wanted to announce um, an upcoming event that we're really excited about here at Outdoor Outreach. Um, it will be taking place on June 11th, and it's called Anchoring Resilience, which is um, an event specifically focused on our communities of color, especially given the recent traumatic events, um, the, the recent death of George Floyd and so many others, um, and the impact that it's had on the Black community. Uh, we really wanted to hold space through this event called Anchoring Resilience, um, and we'll be collaborating with NCHEM and DEFO 
um, of Lumos Transforms um, to really host and facilitate what will be a virtual healing circle. Um, and so we invite you to, to join with us. Again, that's on June 11th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And we invite participants to join, uh, whether it be from your local park, from your backyard, or your indoor space, wherever you feel most comfortable. Um, and so feel free to, uh, to check out the event on our Facebook page. Um, again, this is a space especially for uh, people of color. And so we, we ask um, that, that we hold that space there um, as we're still healing from a lot of the trauma um, that we've experienced over the, the recent weeks. So again, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Tati and Vinny for, for hosting a phenomenal session. Um, and we hope to have you all join us again next week. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next time. Yeah.